My name's Liam and I'm very organized. My day planner is like my Bible. I physically get stomach cramps when I'm running late and I can't leave my room in the morning unless my pajamas are folded and laid out on my bed. So I'm possibly not the most qualified person to be talking to you about spontaneity, but lo and behold, here I am. What I'm here to tell you is to find the things that make you curious and to seize moments of spontaneity because it is when you do this, it is then that you are presented with the moments in your life that are the most dynamic, colorful, and permanent. And I can testify to this because that's exactly what happened to me during my gap year. Two years ago, I went to Australia because I wanted to go and explore my homeland because I'd never really left Perth where I was born in Western Australia. So in order to do this, I had to get a job. So I spent 12 months working in Morrison's, which was horrendous. But the important thing is that I had the constant goal of Australia on my horizon the entire time. So I had something physical to work towards, something to keep me, keep me invigorated. And so after 12 months of being at a checkout, I had my money and I flew to the Southern Hemisphere. And for the first few months, I spent my time there living with my dad, my dad's mother and her partner living in a small bungalow. And one of the peculiar ironies of Australia is that for a country so enormous, they do love to live in very, very small houses. So after a small period of time, I was going slowly nuts. So my father recognized this and had the bold idea that we go up north to go and live with his partner in Karatha. So over the period of five days, Dad and I drive 1,600 kilometers up the coast to Karatha. And for five days, I'm yet again in another confined space, sat next to my dad for hour after hour after hour, surrounded by the same red dirt, the same rocks, the same shrubs for 1,600 kilometers. We arrive in Karatha, which is a small town of 3,000 people who either work in the local mining company or are young children, and there's no one there my age. So I'm very quickly getting bored. So I take the initiative to use my remaining finances to go to Melbourne, to fly, on to, the other sorry, to fly to the other half of the continent and to spend 10 weeks there in this lush green paradise in this new unexplored region of my homeland. And it is there that I am presented with the opportunity to do whatever I want. I have no deadlines, no exams, no revision, no appointment. I am absolutely free. And fortunately, the weekend I arrived, taking place in St Kilda, a district outside of Melbourne, is the Melbourne Pride Festival. So I catch a tram and I go there and it is this glorious procession of colour and music and energy and the street is resplendent with rainbow banners and people in the most fabulous costumes, including one guy who was absolutely festooned with peacock feathers just spearing out of his shoulders and his arms and even on the back of his feet so when he walked they flicked up behind him and it was glorious and that was a really wonderful way to start my new life for the next 10 weeks. And on the tram back, I noticed that there was a fellow looking at me with a particular degree of interest. And so I was also quite interested in looking at this fellow. So I thought, hmm, I should talk to him. So I was wondering when I could find the moment to talk to this guy. And the moment came when the tram stopped and the person next to me wanted to get out. So I took a step back and as I did, my foot got stuck in the tram door. And so um, it was this moment of clumsiness that served as the facilitator to allow me to talk to this guy. And I start talking to him, we quickly become friends, we exchange phone numbers, and so we plan to meet up again in the Valentine's Day festival taking place in St Kilda. That's the first plan. However, it seems the rest of Melbourne had the same idea, because the entirety of one city trying to go from one area to the other was not sustained by the tram network and it just stopped completely. So I was stuck on a tram halfway between Melbourne and St Kilda and I got a text from Sean saying he won't be able to make it. So that original plan, what I had expected, had dissolved. So instead of having that usual feeling of apprehension, that usual feeling of tightness, I decided that I should just go along with it. I should create my own path. And I did. I made friends with this guy on the tram called Barney, who was my age. And so I chatted with him, and then we walked the remainder of the journey to the festival, and I meet his mates, we all party, we go to one of the music tents, and I'm with him for a few hours, and all is well. However, by this point, I'm not especially sober, so my awareness of time and space is somewhat inhibited. So when the music event finishes and progresses elsewhere, I'm not entirely certain of what's going on. So I notice that Barney and his mates are beginning to congregate to move elsewhere. So I take the initiative to grab my bag and get ready to go. And in the instant I grab my bag, the instant I turn around, 
he and the group of girls he's with has absolutely dematerialized. They have vanished amongst the 14,000 other people attending this festival. And it is now that I get that feeling of apprehension where I feel somewhat unsettled given that I am alone in a new part of a new city amongst 14,000 other people. So I tell myself to look around and to, just, to ask random people. Just ask, excuse me, have you seen this tall blonde guy in a blue pinstripe shirt with three black girls? And every time I did ask that question, they would look at me with a peculiar um, expression because no, of course they hadn't. Of course they hadn't seen Barney and his three friends amongst 14,000 other people. So I continue this for 20 minutes and I tell myself towards the end, ask one last person, one last person, and then just go home, okay? So I walk to the edge of the beach and I see this couple sitting down having a cigarette. And I ask them, have you seen this tall blonde guy with a blue pinched up shirt and three black girls? And he just sort of looks at me and rolls his head up and just says, that's a very specific description. No, I haven't. And so they have quite rightly recognized that the state I'm in is not of the clearest mindset. I am quite visibly agitated at being on my own. And so they invite me to sit with them. And it is when I sit with them that I realize how much I needed them, how much I needed to feel safe. Because it was sitting with them that I had this immediate connection which was established through their invitation and then reinforced with the love and support they offered me. Because the similarities apparent within these two people and myself was absolutely astonishing. There was Lulu from Uganda who I cannot relate to but who I instantly fell in love with because she was so infectiously warm and funny and so bright and illuminating. And then her boyfriend coincidentally was also called Liam, whose birthday was on December 8th, the day after my birthday, who also suffered from anxiety issues. So I had someone that I could confide in, someone I could unravel my troubles to. And that is what I needed at that point in this new phase of my life, in a new side of the continent, in a new city on my own. And the more I spent talking to them, the more I felt the strength of our connection, the more I felt safe with these people. I hadn't realized how important it was for me to feel safe. And I feel as though that the beauty of this connection with these wonderful people is the reward for my spontaneity, for finding a new path when all my other plans had dissolved. And such was our friendship struck up on that night. I stayed with them for the remaining three and a half weeks that I was in Melbourne. And it was so peculiar for me to consider this stage of events for someone as inherently organized as myself, someone who folds their pajamas religiously every morning to allow himself to meet someone on a tram and to plan to go with him. That plan dissolves. And to find a new friend on a tram and to plan to go with his friend and that plan dissolves and then to be rewarded for my spontaneity with these luminous, beautiful people, which I had never expected or indeed imagined I could possibly meet. And what I would need to remind myself of in this point was to remind myself that I was doing okay, that I hadn't done so badly. And in order to achieve this, there is a line that I would tell myself repeatedly, a line that would give me strength. And that line is, I haven't done so badly, she thought, lifting her chin and smiling. And that is what I will tell myself, I haven't done so bad. I am in the southern hemisphere, on the other side of the continent, away from my father and my family who can offer me financial aid and shelter, living in a hostel on my own with money I myself have made and finding the experiences that I want to find. And I can tell myself that I need only lift my chin and smile and tell myself I haven't done so bad. And that is a sentiment that I have held with me to this day. And that is why I have tattooed on my arm the words lift and smile. And so ultimately, that is what I wish to impart upon you tonight. To remind yourselves when you feel blue or despondent. To remind yourselves you haven't done so bad. That you need only lift your chin and smile. And to look around you and to find the things that make you curious. And to seize those moments of spontaneity. Because it is when you do that. It is when you stray off track. When you step off a tram and go somewhere else. It is then that you are rewarded with the most dynamic, beautiful and permanent of experiences. Thank you.